Over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about going back to the basics. Talking about Bible stories that you have heard since you were a teenager or since you were a child. Stories that you would probably be able to articulate and you could talk about and you would know a lot of facts about. But sometimes the very basic Bible stories that we know are the things that we just gloss on by. It's good for a child or it's good for a teenager, but it's not good for a mature believer of Jesus Christ. But I say that is not true. I say that the Bible stories that God has given to us in the Word of God are profitable for us. And some of the most easy stories to talk about are some of the most deep, intellectual, thought-provoking things that we could recall. So today we're going to talk about David and David and Goliath. David, a 13-year-old boy, as a shepherd out on the hill, he had seven brothers, all older than him, stronger than him, the dad liked them more than he liked this little runt by the name of David. Saul was the king. Saul was the first king of Israel. And God rejected the calling upon Saul's life because of Saul's impatience and arrogance. So in the midst of that, there was a prophet, a man of God by the name of Samuel. And the prophet by the name of Samuel was talking to God and God rejected Saul's anointing. And God told the prophet Samuel, he said, I want you to go, I want you to go down to Jesse's house. And that's David's dad. And I want you to go down to Jesse's house, and I want you to anoint the very next king of Israel. So in 1 Samuel chapter 16, the prophet, the man of God, is going against what Saul said and following after what God has communicated to him. So he goes down to Jesse's house and, and he stands before Jesse and he, he says, Jesse, I'm here to uh, meet your kids. I want to meet all your sons. And Jesse says, well, I have eight boys. And he said, I would like to see each and every one of them. So Jesse starts calling his boys together and he starts with his oldest boy and his oldest boy, his name is Eliab. And Eliab looked just like Saul. He was tall and large and a robust man, a good looking guy. And by appearance sake, that this would be the very next king of Israel. Eliab came, walks in, stands before Saul. I'm sorry, stands before Samuel and says this. Said, Samuel said, this must be the next king. This must be the Lord's anointing. And God in his spirit said, no, I reject him. And I'm sure Samuel was thinking, why? I mean, this guy is large, he's robust, he looks the part, he looks like he could, he could be the king, he looks like he could command an army. And Samuel said, no, not him. So the next son comes in. No, I reject him as well. All down the line, he had seven men stand before Samuel, and Samuel says, I reject all of them. Samuel said, you must have another son because God would not have had me to come down to your house to anoint the next king if you only had seven. And God told me I had to do this. And Jesse said, well, I do have my youngest son. And the Bible calls him the young man in, 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 in terminology. It could be like the runt of the litter, a smaller boy, somebody that's not the largest or not the best. And Samuel said, I want you to go get him. I want you to, we will not set until the next king of Israel stands before us. So they sent after him out, on the, out being a shepherd, and they brought him in. And as soon as Samuel saw him, he anointed him with oil. It ran from his head down to his shoulders, and they bowed down. And they said, this, this is the very next king of Israel. Chapter 16, this young man by the name of Thir by the name of David that's 13 years old is anointed with the power of God. You can't have 1 Samuel chapter 17. You cannot have a young man by the age of 13 standing up against David against Goliath that's 9 foot 6 inches tall in chapter 17 until you have chapter 16 until the power of God 
was upon his life. And once the power of God, the anointing of the next king of Israel, was upon his life, he heard of the armies. He heard of the Philistine armies that were betraying God for 40 days, defying God. His brothers were up at the camp. And they saw Goliath, this mammoth of a man. And the Bible said they trembled. They were in fear. They were scared to death for 40 days. Goliath came out and shouted at him, yelled at him, mocked him, mocked the holy God. They were scared. And this young boy brings food up to his brothers. Just bringing food up. And he hears Goliath mocking God. He goes into Saul. He says, Saul, why, why are you allowing this uncircumcised Philistine to mock God? He said, he said I'm scared. I, I can't go. And David said, I'll do it. And Saul looked at him and said, you're yet a boy. And this is a warrior from his youth. You have no chance. And David says, Listen, dude, while I've been out shepherding my, my dad's flock, a lion came at me, and I killed a lion. A bear came out, and I killed a bear. I am not afraid of any obstacle. I'm not afraid of them, and I'm surely not afraid of Goliath because God is on my side. I am not fighting him in my power. I'm fighting him in God's power. And just like the lion and just like the bear, this uncircumcised Philistine will die not at my hands, but at the hands of God. You know the story. Saul said, well, I'm scared, but if that's what you want to do, what well, you need to put on my armor. So he tries to put on this arm, and he can't even lift up the sword. He can't lift up the shield. He can't walk in the armor. And David said, I can't. How can I even do this? So he refuses the armor of Saul. And Saul looked at him, and I'm sure he said, Dude, you are going to kill us all. But this is the 40th day. The 40th day, the Philistine army is going to rush us. This is the last day that we have. And they have made a decree if one man stands against Goliath, the winner takes all. So if that's what you want to do, we don't have a chance. Go ahead. The Bible says that when David walks to the valley, Goliath looked at him and mocked at him and said, you're sending yet a boy? A boy? Am I a dog that you would send a boy? And David looked at him, eyes intently. He leaned down and picked up five smooth stones, put it in a sling, and he ran to face Goliath. The armies behind him were trembling. They were scared to stand up. They were scared. But a young man that had the power of God in his life said, I am not afraid. I will go in battle and fight. They ran down face to face. He takes one of the smooth stones and puts it in a sling. And he slings it and he lets it go. And it hits Goliath right in the forehead. It doesn't kill him instantaneously. It knocks him out. David rushes up to the body of Goliath and kills him. And he doesn't just kill him. Sounds a little gross, but there's a point. He takes his own sword, pulls his head, cuts off his head. Raises his head up. And when the army of Israel saw that Goliath had been dead, they rushed the Philistine army and they had complete victory. Because of a 13-year-old boy that has the power of God upon his life could change a nation, could change the direction, could have power. A story, a story that took place. But how do we take that story? And what are some principles that we could take out of two chapters? 1 Samuel chapter 16 and 1 Samuel chapter 17 and apply some things, very simple things within our life that I believe is very important. The first one is God evaluates us by our hearts. God evaluates us by our hearts. In verse 7 of chapter 16, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, 
because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. One of the greatest things as a, as a believer that we have is we have to take what God sees as deep within our soul. The man's opinion. We look at beauty, we look at size, and we look at abilities. We say that he should be the next king, or he should be this, or he should be that. And we look at their appearance, or we look at their abilities, but God looks much deeper than our outward appearance and our abilities. He looks at the heart. He looks deeper in our soul. Man looks at appearance, but God looks deeper than appearance. He looks for the purity of one's life. And I let outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, there are some churches today that, that, uh, that really think that uh, women should not wear makeup. <laughs> and I think that's crazy, okay, by the way. Uh, uh, some churches think it's a sin for women to wear makeup, and I think it's a sin for them not to wear makeup, to tell you the truth. <laughs> um, that's, just a, that's just a joke, but uh, I know, it's just funny, it's just a joke. It's just a joke. <laughs> and all the men said, amen, paint the barn, right? Paint the barn, all right. When you look at what God looks at the purity, he looks at the heart, he looks at the soul. There's not a greater illustration than this than the woman at the well. The woman at the well was a woman in total outcast. Been married many times and now is living with a, a man that uh, is not her husband. And Jesus went into Samaria for an appointment to meet this woman. This woman needed something that she could not satisfy in her own needs. She looked at every area of life for satisfaction. She could not find satisfaction. So in the heat of the day, she went to a well and she encountered Jesus. And Jesus started a conversation with her. And Jesus looked at her heart. And Jesus saw her greatest need. And when Jesus saw her greatest need, he met her need. He met her need of love and purity. And he healed her of all sin, forgave her for what she had done. And because of that encounter with Jesus at the well, the city of Samaria saw Jesus. And they believed in Jesus, not because of her testimony. They believed in Jesus because she encountered him and invited him into the city. What it does when somebody with a pure heart comes after Christ, looks after Christ, challenges others to follow after Christ, God can change the world through little incidents, little scenarios, little opportunities that we think is not a big deal. But God has planted within our life an obstacle or an opportunity to meet God's calling. The second thing, God chooses those who seem unqualified. And I love this about God. He doesn't pick the, the most articulate, the most educated, the best of everything. God uses sometimes the most unqualified in order to fulfill God's calling because when we the unqualified fulfill what God wants us to do. We understand just what David did. I killed a lion and I killed a bear and I will do the same thing to Goliath because God is with me. This little runt of a young man that his dad and his brothers didn't even like. They didn't even want him at the dinner table. He was elevated to the next king of Israel. It took 30 years from the age of 13. It took 30 years before he was actually the next king. But the Bible said the power of God was upon him from the moment Samuel anointed him the next king of Israel. Power. God's presence. God allowed a young man to have the ability to change the world, to protect his country to become a great warrior. But he was unqualified. The Bible says there remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said, Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes hither. So what do you think God looks for in the qualities 
of a young man. If, if God doesn't look at the outward appearance, if God looks at the heart, what do you think God looks for? If you're looking at a young man or a young woman of God and God has touched their life and God is bringing purpose within their life, what do you think God looks at? I think David had some qualities that we need to try to have. He had a heart for God. He had a heart for God. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, it says this. But now your kingdom shall not continue. God is talking to um, Saul. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. The Lord has commanded him to be the commander over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded to you. God is saying, Saul, you're done. It was 30 years before he ended his own life in battle. But God told him, he said, no more. I am taking, I'm ripping your country from you. You are no longer going to be the king. I'm looking for a man after God's own heart, after my own heart. And then all the way into Acts chapter 13, verse 22, Paul wrote this. And when he had removed him, he raised up from them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man who my own heart who will do my will. I believe God looks for the qualities of a pure heart. He didn't say you had to be sinless. Thank God for that. He just said you have to have a pure heart. You have to desire ultimate worship with God. You have to not be afraid to stand up and worship his name, stand up and communicate, stand up and face deals with life. You have to have a pure heart. And then he was dependable. He was dependable. When somebody needed him, he was always at service. The sheep needed him, and he killed a lion and a bear to protect them. Saul, when he lost the Spirit of God upon his life, and he was tormented, he called a young boy by the name of David to come to the, ta come to the temple and to play a harp to rest his soul. Whenever somebody needed him, he was always willing to serve. And I believe dependability is one of the most awesome things that we can have. There's two traits that we should have, dependability and availability. When somebody needs you, even if it's an inconvenience, we should always try to serve. We should always try to love. We should always try to communicate the hope of Jesus through opportunities and through problems. And then he had integrity. He had integrity. In verse uh, 13, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16, he said, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. His brothers didn't like him. Remember that? His brothers didn't want him to be around. But Samuel anointed David in front of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. You know, there's nothing greater than watching a young man or a young woman getting the call of God upon their life. And doing whatever it takes to follow after God's call. You see them as a young, fiery soul for Christ. To communicate, to stand in the face of adversity. To communicate the truth at all opportunity. They have the power of God upon their life. It is awesome to see them grow up. It's awesome to see them start to minister. It's awesome to see what their life is all about 20 or 30 years down the road. I had the privilege of being a youth pastor for many years, and, and now you're looking back at those teens that are now um, 40 years old, 35 years old, and you're seeing what they're doing. And, and of course, some have left the church, but some are pastors and missionaries. You see those that you went to camp with, and they gave their life to Christ, and you see what they're doing. It brings a joy to your soul when you see what God has done with individuals' lives that have given their life to Christ. I love that part of ministry. When a young man gets the call upon God and God empowers him, gives to him the spirit, gives to him the ability to, sh to, to move mountains for him, I think that's what the qualities that God is looking for. He sees deep in your soul. He knows what you can do. He empowers us to do certain things. But here's what God does. God prepares us by giving us difficult jobs. He does. He, he, he gives us very difficult jobs. 
Uh, it, it would be nice if we could look at this story and say, well, this young boy just went down and he killed Goliath. Well, it didn't happen that way. There was a preparation stage to get to where David had the ability to do that. Number one, he had to be submissive to his father. He had to be submissive to God. And he had a lion, and he had a bear, and he defeated giants within his life. And he faced an obstacle that everybody else was in fear and trembling. They were scared to death. But David had the power of God. And when we have the power of God within our life, we can do great and mighty things. Awesome things. But we cannot take the philosophy of our world and the fear of our insecurities and look at our inadequacies and say, if I'm inadequate in this area, surely I can't do anything for God. We have to understand that if we are a believer in Jesus Christ and we gave our life to Christ, the Holy Spirit of God lives within our soul. We have the power. We have the ability. David did pick up those five rocks. David did put it in the sling. David did turn it. But when he let it go, God defeated Goliath. And in our problems, in our Goliaths, and our issues, we may have obstacles along the way. God may be training us and moving us to do great and mighty things, but we just like David, we have to get on our knees before God and we know that we are going to fight, but we're going to fight in Christ's name. That God is going to do great things for us. The giant. David could call his, his giant. He could see his giant, nine foot six inch man. David was a 13 year old boy. Everybody looked at that battle. Impossibility. Not going to happen. And if we look at that, we would agree with that. Impossibility. The difference is in chapter 16. He had the power of God upon his life. And when we have the power of God upon our life, we can name our giants. You can name your giants. I could name my giants in life. The giants that we face on a daily basis. The giants that make us fearful. The giants that we tremble. The giants that we stick our head in the sand and hope they go away. Those things that captivate us, that hold us in bondage. Those things that we've struggled with for years are the giants within our life that we have no idea how to defeat. They scare us. What's the difference? Is David, when he saw his giant, he knew his power. He knew God was on his side. He ran to meet his giant. He didn't hide from it, stick his head in the sand. He didn't have somebody else fight that battle for him. He knew it was his. And he knew God was on his side. Goliath, any giant obstacle in your pathway of blessing is your giant. Any obstacle that's between you and God's blessing and God's power and his will for your life is a giant. And we have to name that giant. We have to have the ability to say, I cannot do what God wants me to do if I allow that giant to captivate me. If I do not have victory over this giant, I'm going to have a deja vu life. I'm going to struggle with the stupid sin, this stupid giant in front of me for the rest of my life. And it's going to be month after month, week after week, year after year of the same old, same old. We get tired of that. God wants more for you than that. God wants us to have victory over our issues of life. So how do we do that? The first thing I believe using this illustration, we have to find the battlefront. We have to find the battlefront. In verse 11, when Saul and all of Israel heard these words from the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You have to realize, and I have to realize, the thing that I'm afraid about, the thing that I'm dismayed about, the thing that is 
holding me back. I have to be able to see it and understand it and pray about it and ask God to deliver me from it. I have to understand my battleground. I have to name my giant. I have to understand this is my battleground. I don't need to fight somebody else's giants. I don't need to talk about somebody else's giants. I have to have me and God and my giant, and I have to be able to be prepared, and God is going to move us through obstacles, through situations to prepare us to defeat that giant. We have to be willing to do the little things in order to do the great thing. But we are so afraid I may fail. I'm so afraid I'm inadequate. I'm so afraid I will fail in front of somebody. I just run and cower and I will not fight. And what happens? That giant just gets bigger. The army gets bigger. There's more things that we are afraid about. And we become doomed in our fear because we're not willing to face the giant. We have to find the battlefront. We have to name it. We have to claim it. We have to identify the enemy. We have to identify the enemy. If we do not identify the enemy, we will never have victory over it. See, David's brother, Eliab, he wanted to fight David. He even went up to him and said, what are you doing up here? You're, you're just a boy. Go back down to daddy. And David looked at him and he said, what is this? You're not willing to fight this giant, this man that defies God? Are you? What are you doing? And Eliab says, I know your heart, your heart of insolence. Go back. All you're trying to do is show us up. You already were a king. You're already anointed. Get out of here. And David did not listen to his brothers. He didn't listen to Saul. He knew that he had a job to do and that giant was in front of him and he was not going to allow anybody to stand in his way. He even said this, I'm sure, just what Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. I am not going to allow you to defeat me in my spirit. I've got a job to do. I'm going to name it. I'm going to witness it. I'm going to be prepared for it. And when I see my giant, I'm going to go into that opportunity I'm going to run head into it. I may get knocked down. I may even get knocked out. But I am not going to be afraid to name my giant. I'm not. So often, we know it. You can close your eyes and you can make a list of the things that have you bound within your life. You open your eyes. We kind of ignore them. As long as I don't look at it. As long as I don't deal with it, as long as I can hide from it, I don't have to deal with my enemy. The enemy is always there, <coughs> lurking, watching, wondering, always setting up opportunities for a trap. Always. And the third thing is we need to fight in God's strength. We need to fight in God's strength. Um, I want to just read a, a few verses. Um, then he took a staff of his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and a sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistines. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore a shield went before him. And the Philistines looked about David and disdained him. And he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine caused David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give you flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the fields. In other words, this guy was trying to intimidate David. This man, nine foot tall, said, If you come to me, I'm going to chop you up in little pieces that the birds are going to come down, and they're going to fly away with every little piece of your body. I'm going to destroy you. Now, we would get scared. This guy has the physical ability to destroy David. He would eat him up in a fight if it wasn't for God's power. 
And once we understand that our fight in God's power can produce victory, then we can go into this battle with our eyes wide open, with understanding that I can have victory. But you have to go in three areas. You have to go with your armor. You can't fight in somebody else's armor. Saul tried to get David to put on his armor. David looked at this and he said, this isn't me. I cannot have victory if I am not myself. I have to go into battle with what I know, with what God has prepared me with. And I may not be a warrior. I may be inadequate as a soldier. But I have something that's greater than anyone in this army. I have the power and the blessing of God. And I know, I know I'm going to survive. I know because I have a purpose within my life. And my purpose is to be the next king of Israel. I can fight a battle. I can fight this giant because I know that God has a plan for my life. And as a young man or as a young lady, we have to understand if God has a plan for me, if I am focused on him, he may ask me to do great things. He may ask me to do the mundane things. But if I know that God has a plan within my life and I am faithful to him, he is going to protect me in everything. Everything. But we have to be willing to face it. So often we have great dreams and we know what God wants to do. But we're afraid to face the giant. And because we're face, afraid to face the giant, God does have a perfect will for our life. But we say, I don't want that. I'm willing to do this. And we move from God's perfect will to a permissive will. God wants us to be in his perfect God-fearing will. He's going to prepare us. But he wants you to be yourself. Quit putting the masks on. Quit using somebody else's armor. Quit trying to fight somebody else's battle. Quit trying to fight another giant. Face the giant that God has called you to face. That you're fearful of. That maybe nobody else even knows what your giants are. You do. And this is between you and God. I can't fight your giants. You can't fight my giants. You'd probably be able to beat my giants without any problem. It's not my giant that you're worried about. It's your giant. But you have to be yourself. You have to use your own armor. And then after you use your armor, use God's ammunition. God's word. Use what he has given to you. Understand that you have the power of the Holy Spirit within your life. Understand that God has prepared you, moved you, and made you to who you are. And God wants to do great things with you. He wants to give to you the ability with his ammunition, with his words, with his encouragement. He wants to make sure that you are who you need to be. All the way through your life, you can look at this and you can see every problem, every obstacle as a learning time. A point of your life that God is preparing you to be somebody that he wants you to be. We don't have to get mad at God. We don't have to say why. We may not understand everything that God does, and we surely don't, but God loves us. Just like a young boy at the age of 13, he couldn't understand everything that God was doing within his life, but he understand he understood that God gave him power. He understood that he had the power of God within his life, and he could do great things. He was not going to allow people to defeat him, obstacles to defeat him. He was going to allow every obstacle to stand up and to make him to who he wanted to be and who God wanted him to be. But the last one, and I want you to think about, is we have to finish off the enemy. We have to finish off the enemy. I like what the Bible says. That he took those five stones and he put it in a sling and he twirled it and hit Goliath right in the forehead. Goliath passed out. David ran to him as he was dazed before the armies could come in took his own sword and killed Goliath. Here's what we do. In our Goliaths, sometimes we have courage. I'm going to quit. 
No more. I'll never do this again. I will stop. I'm going to come to the altar and I'm going to pray, God, don't let me do this again. I will do anything you tell me to do. Just. And then you walk out the door and we go back doing the exact same thing we did before we walked in. I tried to give it to you, God. I had a desire within my soul. When we get in the face of our giant and we give it to God, we not only daze our giant, you must destroy that giant. You have to allow God the ability to get into your life, to give you that courage, to give you that motivation that I am not going to allow that giant to destroy me. I am not going to allow him to move me. I am not going to allow him to deter me. I am going to understand this is my problem. I am going to face my problem, and I'm going to destroy my problem. <laughs> David and Goliath, a simple story, all the way back in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and 17. But it's funny how that same story comes to us today. I was on Right Now Ministries this way, it's our video ministry that we can watch and, and we can learn from. And I was typing all kinds of different things in, trying to get ideas for our, for our sermons for this upcoming week. And you know what I came down to? I went to the kids' zone on Right Now Ministries. Adventureland, Right Now Ministries. And I started clicking on characters, and I watched about five or six different kids' movies on Bible characters. And that's where I got the idea, you know what, let's take simple Bible stories that we've all heard, we've all watched, but let's take those Bible stories and apply it. So here's my application for you. We're going to have a song of invitation. The giant that is keeping you from doing what God wants you to do has to be slain. Could God supernaturally Slay your giant. Yeah, he could. He could say, gone. But that's not going to make you who God wants you to be. And if you do not face your giant today, you will face him tomorrow. If you do not slay your giant when he is wounded, he will rear his ugly head pretty soon. We have to see it. We have to name it. We have to expose it. We have to destroy it, or that giant will soon be back in your life. Do you guys agree with that? You know your giants. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, please stand to your feet, and I'm going to have a word of prayer. And then we're going to have a song of invitation. Sometimes we have invitations here, and sometimes we don't. But today, when we're talking about the giants of our life, we would be very foolish to think that you have power in yourself to walk out these doors and destroy the giants that have captivated you for many years. Unless you get on your face before God. Unless you say, Lord, I know what my giants are. I talk to you about my giants. I need you to take over. I need you to give me the ability to say, I am done. I want to destroy my giant that's in my life that has had victory over me and I need to give it to you. You don't need to talk to anyone except for God. And he wants to take your life and just like David, he wants to give you the power and the ability to the focus to name it, identify it, and to conquer it. And ultimately destroy it. Because if you do not destroy it, it will destroy you. And you have the ability. You have the faith. You have the strength. You have the power of God to look dead in the eyes of the giants that are destroying you. And a father that loves you to a point that he wants the best for you. And if you, um, dad, dad, I need your help. And just like any dad, stand behind me, son. Let me walk through this one with you. And with God's power, he is going to allow you to face the giants of your life that you have fought over, you have struggled with, and you had fear over for months, years, or your entire life. 
Give it to God and let God fight your battle with you, for you, and in you. Dear Father, 